Hi guys. So this session is um, a very exciting one actually. Um, we weren't able to host, so for, on the Fridays for South Asian Heritage Month, we were um, hosting a mefil, um, so showcasing dance and music, but the last two we had to postpone, so we will be doing those later in September. Um, so really excited that today Rahim, very, very talented Rahim will be performing Kathak for us today. Um, if we have time, maybe he'll do two performances. Um, oh, hi, Jaimini, a leading Kathak exponent in this country. Jaimini Sahai. Wow, amazing. Thank you, Jaimini. So honoured that you could join us this evening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and the performance. So for those that are not familiar with the format of this conversation, of these series, I usually give it until about five past to let people join. So if you want to go and get a drink, because it's really hot, it, I know it's just started raining where I am in London, but still a scorcher nonetheless. If you want to go and get a drink, I've got mine, my mango juice. Um, so yeah, this is this is essentially like the metal sort of series. And I usually dress up for it because the guests make the effort to dress up. So I thought I'll do the same. And you know, we haven't been able to go out in lockdown. So this is just the, excuse to dress up as you would if you were to go to a methyl or better so we'll give it a few more minutes to allow enough people to join um, and the format is as follows so I will do an introduction to Rahim and for those that are not familiar with who he is and then I'll invite him to the conversation he will then do a short performance so for those that are not aware of what Gatak entails, you will have an insight into that and obviously Rahim's particular style of um, expression. Um, I'll announce what song that is, one of my absolute favourite classical songs. Uh, it is a film song. So he'll be performing to that and then we'll move on to Rapid Fire Round, which is essentially an icebreaker, just some fun questions to get to know Rahim as as a person and then we'll move on to the conversation and delve a little bit deeper into Rahim's journey as a dancer and all that jazz pun intended and then the last 15 20 minutes I usually leave for comments questions feedback for you guys so for those who are have joined in um, what I do, do normally do is I disable the comments um, as soon as the conversation starts and that's just to allow myself and the guests to have an unfiltered conversation without distraction but please by all means whatever questions you have any comments feedback just drop it in the comments box and even though it's it will be disabled from from sort of your point of view when I enable the comments at the end they will still appear so if there's something you resonate with um, throughout the conversation please by all means interact through the comments and the hearts as well let's give it a minute or two one more minute still have time to grab a drink I've got my fan on if if you could let me know um, can you still hear me with the fan on in the background if not I'll turn it off is, is the fan distracting or is it okay take that as a yes. It's now 8.05 so I will disable the comments and we'll begin the introduction. So this conversation as I said is with the very talented Rahim Mir. So for those that are not aware of who Rahim is, Rahim is a trained performer and artist. He is a Kathak dancer who has been lauded for challenging, challenging gender boundaries through Indian classical dance, namely through Kathak. He performs in dance roles typically reserved for women and is famous for his feminine interpretation of Kathak, as well as his ability to elegantly adopt the feminine garb. I you will know, turn this off actually. According to Rahim, gender is all about a spectrum and is unrelated to one sex. 
A versatile dancer, Rahim has also performed in various Bhangra shows. Consequently, the idea of gender within a uh, dancer and their form is a key aspect that Rahim explores within both professional and academic fields. He believes that boundaries are there to be pushed and questions are there to be asked. A recent double master graduate from Royal Holloway University of London, Rahim will be pursuing his doctorate this October where he hopes to investigate the queer narrative in Kathak. He has performed at the South Bank Centre, the West End and in January 2017 delivered a TED talk titled Adorning an Identity and Exploring Gender Fluidity Through Dance. So let's invite Rahim. I will let him announce what he will be performing. Hey, Rahim. Hi, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Please carry on, I'll come back. <laughs> no, 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 that's my intro to you finished. I hope um, I covered everything. Was that good? Yeah, it was, it was ideal, it was brilliant. I apologize for the loud crows in the background. No, um, you know, I can't hear any crows, but if you can hear thunder and rain, then I apologize for that. All of a sudden it started raining here in London. Um, but um, so what I've explained to everybody is the format and I've told them that you're gonna start with a performance. I love how we're matching by the way. Yes, this is, not this planned. is, this is completely it's unintentional. Planned. We didn't plan this. Yes, but, but you know, it just goes to show we are on the same wavelength. So, um, Oh, I can see it's very hot where you are. So, Raheem, if you want to introduce what you will be performing before we start the questions. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, well, um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining. Uh, yes, I will start off with the intro to quite an iconic, iconic number. Um, I've performed this number a few times, um, once at um, a Sangeet, which was very interesting, and I'm sure we can get oh, into wow. that. Um, yeah. <laughs> afterwards. I would um, love to. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, it's incredible. Um, it's with one of my absolute idols, Madhubala, in mm. one of the most iconic roles in Mughliazam. So this is the intro of Pyar Kiya To Dar Na Kiya. Yeah, but take it away, Raheem. Oh my God, I'm going to try. Okay, you have to tell me <laughs> if you can see me. Cause... Okay, I'll just, so just set yourself up and I will let you know. I'll set myself up. How do I look mm -hmm. from... Here. Perfect. Looking Good. great. Good. Right. I'm going to have to come back because this is what With happens. The audio in there. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no help. You know what I mean? I'm That's my say. absolute favorite film. Um, it's just, like you said, so iconic. I love, you know, all the music pieces, the dances, the costumes. Amazing. I'm so glad it's that you're performing. Glad. Anyone and who doesn't know what this film is, you, you know, you're in for a treat if you haven't seen Raheem perform before. Yeah, so, so just for you that don't know, Pyar Kiya To Dar Na Kiya loosely translates into when one has loved, then what has one left to fear? Um, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's about that power and that um, emotion being so powerful for one that there is, no, there is nothing left to fear because love is so powerful in itself that we fear love and for what it will do to us as an emotion. So yeah. yes, here we go. All right, I hope you guys enjoy Take it. Take it away. Okay, let's just make sure the volume is correct. Okay, here we go. Thank you. 
Yeah. Wow, Raheem, that was epic. I don't know if, if you could see from that far away, but the hearts were just flying in abundance for you. They're still there. You can thank see you. the remnants of them. Thank you. Oh, thank Raheem, I'll let you, catch your, I'll let you catch your breath before we yeah. interrogate you. <laughs> um, oh, that was just majestic. It really was. Um, I'll let you. I'll let let you take a few sips before we, you know, ask the question. It's okay. I'm good. Uh, I, I want to turn on the comments, but I will leave it to the end because that's that's the structure that I've been following. But you can see on the side there. Yeah. That was just. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> and you know, as you were dancing, it was thundering here where I am. It just added to the whole to the whole mood. Oh God, it was so good. You just can't make that up. Anyway, let's dive right into it. If we have time, then, you know, Raheem um, will grace us with another performance. So let's get through these questions and, and get to know Raheem a little bit more closely. So we're going to start with um, an icebreaker. Like I said, it's just, it's just, um, it's, it's all fun. Don't take any pressure from it. Just to no get pressure. to know you. I got you. I know you well enough. No pressure. Right. So let's start. What is a song that evokes memories of your childhood? Um, and rapid fire round. <laughs> oh crap! It, I can't remember what it's called, but it goes to Hemiri Kiran. No, no, no. Oh right, that from Dan. From yeah, Dan. Oh, okay. yeah, with Shahrukh Khan. Okay, yeah. I thought you were going to say something classical, but yeah, that is iconic. That no, is an that iconic one. song. Either that one or In Hilo Gone. If you wanted a classical one, oh. that always reminds me of my childhood. I loved In Hilo Gone, so beautiful. Okay, your favorite Kathak mudra? My favorite Kathak mudra uh, is probably anything to do with Radha. Um, I think the Gungat is my favorite one, but it goes, it's instead of this one, it's this one. Uh, yeah, that's oh. my favorite one. Oh, beautiful, I love that. Um, right, so you're having a dinner party, Raheem, and okay. you're allowed to invite three guests, living or dead. Who would you invite? Who would I invite? Um, I'd invite uh, Madhubala. Of course. Of course, duh. <laughs> um, I'd invite Beyonce. Um, and I'd invite Will Smith. Because I feel like he needs some help after the whole thing that he's gone through with Jada. <laughs> oh my God. That's, that's, that's the man that's not getting no more meals from his wife. And he'll be oh, glad dear. to get a home cooked meal. <laughs> Can I join that table? I'd love to be at the table. Will Smith is my favorite. I love Madhubala and Beyonce. Yeah, I could just listen to her singing. I just, I just oh. want to know what she's like. And then I think I'll get over it. Do you know what I mean? Who, who Madhubala? No, no, Beyonce. Oh, okay. Yeah, Madhubala is yeah. not alive, obviously. But like I said, living or dead. Great yeah, table. living or dead. But it would be nice to have Rekha and Amita Bachchan oh. there just to see the gossip. Oh, that's, that's scandalous, isn't it? <laughs> I like it. Scandal. Okay, go. Pull up a chair for me at that table. Okay, yeah. right. You've been given the ability to travel back in time to perform a dance sequence from a film of your choice. What dance sequence would that be? Ooh. It would be your face. It would be you instead of that. Like, yeah. So um, we would associate you with that dance as opposed to the actress or actor. Crap, man. These are good questions. Um, it would yeah. have to be... Um, Mohe Pangarpe. Oh, from Mughal Azam also. Oh, I love that. I, I that see. That to me means so much, um, and mm. it really allowed me to explore parts of my being that I didn't even know existed. We we will get into that for sure. I think I think there's a theme here with the Radha Radha Krishna type of dance. Yeah, Radha Krishna. I, think... I also really enjoy Lakshmi and Parvati are my two other things. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, hopefully we can get into this. Yeah. Final question. Oh, um, yes, final question. What does the term British Asian mean to you? Because obviously we're celebrating South Asian Heritage Month, sharing our you know, illustrious heritage. So what does this term mean to you? Um, to be British Asian means to be a body within a space that inhabits two worlds. Um, to be somebody but to also be no one um, and oh. to be a statistic, I think, for a lot of people and a chance to really explore your own terms of authenticity and truth. Mm. And it also allows a person who is British Asian 
to combine two cultures together and to be a bridge between a world, uh, between two worlds that have such yeah. a past. Um, yeah. To say that you encapsulate both. I mean, can one truly encapsulate both? Really, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But because there's so many conflicts between the two, mm -hmm. but allowing us this British Asian title mm -hmm. also allows us and, you know, almost permits us in a world where we probably wouldn't be regarded as something, but it gives us mm -hmm. a chance to prove something. And I think that's what it means. I love that. And, you know, let's, let's move on to the, you know, uh, actual questions here. So I've asked you that question specifically because I know that you have a dual heritage so if you want to expand on that. Yeah, so we grew up um, with English family um, on my father's side and with um, Punjabi family on my mother's side. So we okay. grew up in a very, very interesting household in which we were inhabiting two cultures. And yeah. one thing that always really sticks out in my mind is two forms of discipline. Um, in which we would have, you know, the chance to talk about things, but then we would be silenced. <laughs> so it was, it what was a, a very- What a paradoxical world. Yeah, it was like, it oh. was very much like you would be asked why, you know, by my <laughs> English side, and they would want right. an answer. Whereas my but Punjabi, my nanny might go, Ki? and that was it. <laughs> yes. And I was like, yes. what? and then everyone goes, shut up, don't say it. Like, wow. you know what I mean? So wow. yeah, I think that's one it's thing so that I always think about. That that's something, I mean, like I said, that's unique to you that you have this English heritage, like um and, and the Punjabi heritage. And I think we can all relate. I mean, obviously I have Punjabi um ancestry on both sides. So being British Asian, being born in this country, oscillating between the two cultures is hard enough. But I can imagine how confusing that might have been sometimes for you. Like you just said, your dad, your English dad wants an explanation because you're encouraged to speak and give answers. Whereas the Punjabi side or the South Asian side, um, completely opposite. That, that, is, that is interesting. And I'm sure that's shaped your character and we'll delve into that yeah. um, you know, throughout the course of this conversation. But bringing it back to dance now. So there's this, um, this claim or an assertion that that you're shattering gender stereotypes through dance, like, you know, predominantly through Kathak, you know, dressing in anarchalese or feminine clothing. I say that in air quotes as well. Dancing elegantly, gracefully, like, like a female. But we know that there's also been, you know, many great male Indian classical Kathak exponents like Pandit Birju Maharaj, for example. And he came from um, a family where the, the, the males were dancers, so he learned from his uncles, right? So with that in mind, what are your thoughts on this claim that you're shattering gender stereotypes? Because men have occupied this space of Gatak traditionally as well. But there's this notion that you are dismantling, questioning gender in this space. What would yeah. you say? Um, yeah, I think that, I think to claim that I'm shattering anything is quite a claim uh, and it's quite a title that a lot of people bestow upon me and I never initially asked for it um, okay. and, it, and it was something that was given to me I kind of I kind of did what I did and started to challenge the gender norms um, that not that gut didn't give me but the teachers had given me that mm -hmm. workshops had given me that right. culture and society had given me and to give a dancer who wants to specialize and wants to explore a form that has no gender binary, and but to mm. tell the dancer that you have a binary makes no right. sense to me at all. Yes. Um, yes. And I was never, I was someone that always grew up very fluid anyway within myself. Um, when I was growing up until, I don't know, I was probably hitting puberty, I was always getting confused for a girl. When I was little, my mother, you know, my mother would get compliments to say, oh, your daughter's so pretty, you know? And every single time I pick up the phone, it'd be like, oh, hi, how are you, ma'am? You know, the other day, someone at the McDonald's yeah. drive-thru still said it to me. So I was like, okay, I don't know if <laughs> I've hit puberty yet. I don't know what's going on. But, yeah. um, 
I, I think that to say that I'm shattering, I think that I'm just bringing it back into the conversation. This form exactly. has no binary. The people that were initially dancing, yes, were the men. And the men were performing um, as women and, you know, as whatever um, form they had to take, whatever deity, whatever, you know, performance you were doing. Because initially it was all as Gatagars, as storytellers, we would tell yeah. the story of Hindu mythology and the Hindu faith. Um, yes. So, you know, to say to me that I can't essentially embody, say, Radha, say, Lakshmi, say, Sita, for example, when we get booked to do Diwali gigs, you know, like, to say that I can't embody that I, um, through physical garb and garment is weird mm -hmm. to me. Because if mm -hmm. I've seen little girls growing up dressing up as Krishna, then why am I not allowed to now dress up as Radha? And yeah. it's not to say I want to be a woman, nor do I want people to go, that's a woman, or to say, this is someone so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. I'm just showing a realized version of her. I just seem to, like, I want to now blend those two identities together to show you the grace of Radha, but then maybe to show you a masculine energy of Krishna to, you know, and I think, I think mm -hmm. in the form, you can personify that quite easily. So yeah, yeah. yeah, so to go back to the idea of me shattering gender norms, mm -hmm. I guess I am a little bit, but yeah. also at the same but time, you didn't, not. you didn't set out to do that. That no, was not what your I set out, what I set out to do, I'll be honest, is that when I got told that I wasn't allowed to do something, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that didn't sit right with me because yeah. you can't mm -hmm. dictate the form to me when I have done my own research and I have performed in pieces where half an hour then I'll be a man, the other half I'm a woman, then I'm a frog, mm -hmm. then I'm a turtle. Then I have to be the wind yeah. and I have to go. Yeah. So you're now telling me that I can't be an element. Yeah. Or yeah. I can't yeah. be an animal for the sake of a story. Exactly. You know, Raheem, this, this brings me on to um to another point that I wanted to highlight. So or two points rather. It's, it's a two two-folded sort of point. In um Shakespearean times, men would dress up and portray women, right? Absolutely. That was the norm. Well, that's where the word we, drag came from. Exactly, right. I'll let you elaborate on that in a moment. Yeah. But so that was the first point that Shakespearean time, they, um, they did. They dressed as women and performed as women. And like I said, completely was the norm of the time. But alongside that, if we think about belly dancing as a, as a dance form, traditionally that was also performed by men. So I just wanted to share something for those that may not be familiar. You might be. Um, but belly dancing is something we see as really seductive, really salacious, right? So male belly dancing is not a new thing. Male, there are male belly dancers that exist in Turkey. But um, when we see a man dancing like that, it doesn't fit within our own gender construct, viewing it from the Western lens. But that's what they did. Um, I think the word is Zene, Zene dancers. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But they dated back to the Ottoman Empire and they performed in the court of the Sultan because women were prohibited from performing. So the men performed those roles. And it was often, um, you know, non, the non-Muslim population, so Greeks, Arme Armenians, Romans, and they would be trained as dancers, adopting, you know, androgynous or feminine clothing, garb and makeup, completely normal. So what you're doing, you know, why I said, are, are you shattering this claim that people are putting on you, quite a heavy claim. This is something that has existed. Um, even if we think about uh, Shiva, Lord Shiva or, or Nataraj, the way he, he's posing, the way he's standing, we can deem that to be really feminine. That's a masculine energy, Shiva or Nataraj. But the way he's standing, you could say, is very, is very feminine, but it's a masculine dance. Shiva is a masculine energy. So those are the things I wanted to share. Um, it, it, do you want to elaborate on those? Oh well, yeah, I, was just, I mean, everything you said, yeah, makes total sense. I mean, initially when it came to any form of dance, it began a lot with the men that were doing it. I mean, there are some cultures now um, it, where in Afghanistan, for example, you have the Natya, which is the Afghanistani dancing boys. So there is okay. still a culture there in which they, um, they uh, go around and look 
for young boys as young as six or seven who might be of a lower class or a poorer background yes. find them in playgrounds and work with them um and say look do you want to make some money you're very pretty and so on and so forth they dress them mm. up and train them to dance for hordes of men and for hordes mm. of men of elite classes and i think that's one thing that astounds yes. me to this day that this is still happening you know mm. and and women would never be caught dead in those areas um, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. whether whether it be a religious reason whether it be the state of obviously, obviously i'm not going into that whole thing but mm -hmm. you know these cultures of dancing boys has always existed you see it exactly. in literature you see it in artwork you see it in sculpture mm -hmm. You see mm -hmm. um, boys dancing for the sultans, boys dancing mm -hmm. in the harems, um, yeah. and they were picked because they were attractive men, um, mm -hmm. and pretty androgynous men. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's all a very very interesting concept, and I mm -hmm. think growing up feeling very um, fluid in myself and feeling sort of very androgynous in the way that I was, even though I do identify as a man and as a male. Um, I still feel a different energy when I perform. So I think that's why I chose to embody this non-binary form that yeah. people see in front of them because it's something that if I connect with and I can do, then I should, because that's what gives my dance life, you know? Yes, yes. I mean, what was, um, just going back to your childhood and inspiration, do you remember that moment where you, that, that spark was ignited in you for Kathak and you, and you watched something or you heard something and you, and you felt, what was that feeling that I compelled grew, you to explore this? I grew up listening to a lot of, um, a lot of classical pieces, uh, guzzles in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up listening to um, my mama and, you know, his obsession with Shairi and my mother's obsession with Guzzle. Um, and I was fortunate enough to grow up with both sets of grandparents. So I had their influence in me. My grandmother would put on Umraujan, would put on, you know, things like this and watch them. And she'd say, Rahim, Vik, Vik, Mina Kumari, Kiki, Gurdi, Vik. And I was like, yeah, I know. And it's incredible. And I would watch them and I'd go, like, if you look at Rekha, for example, in Dil Cheese Gyaya, which is an incredible piece uh, from Umraujan, she doesn't do anything for that first mm. whatever like minute or two she just sits there and i thought if somebody can take that energy sit there and have everyone around them just in awe that intrigued me um and i think i had all of that in my in like my mentality and thinking i need to dance so i grew up dancing in a lot of western forms had all of my classical training there it wasn't until i got older and found classes near me that I was like, okay, do you know what? I'm going to give it a go. I went to go and see a friend perform. And I'll be honest, I looked at her and I said, she's doing it all wrong. <laughs> and, yeah. and I looked at her and I said, no, that's not how you do no. it. Yeah. And I went the next day and I said, sign me the hell up. We're doing it. <laughs> and I never looked back. I love it. Yeah, I love it. No, I, you were born to do this. When I first saw you, my sister and we both saw you. Ah, oh. it was just mesmerizing. Koi loves me here, It was just no words, and I. It was just so captivating, and um, all your dance forms, whether that's Gatak, Bhangra, even I know you've done some hip hop. Oh my God, there is this video of Rahim on his Instagram. Please do check it out. Give him a follow. I'm not going to say anything about it because you just you just need to watch it. I might share it after this conversation for those that haven't seen. And the, the way he just brings the fire to the floor. That's <laughs> off to you. That's <laughs> off to you. Thank you. Um, how, did, how did you feel the first time? So this is, again, twofold question. How did you feel the first time when you adopted the, the feminine garb? And what was your parents' response to you wearing the feminine sort of attire and dancing? to a style which is now deemed as female dance form? Um, I 
would always wear kurtas and occasionally they would give me angarkas that didn't have as much care as everyone else unless we did like a sufi piece then we all had the care the turns and everything the first time i ever performed fully female um where i had no beard i had hair i had everything on the first time that i and i had a chest in which was hilarious uh, hilariously done um yeah i did uh, i actually did dil cheese kya hai for a lecture demonstration at rich mix um and that was the first time i fully felt like a woman like i was like if i walk down the street now no one's clocking me no one's going to tell me anything i was going to say excuse, it, excuse me ma'am yes. like, yeah yes. and the first yes. time i ever did that i felt I almost felt like the movements and things that I was doing were justified. Now that my now my female energy was justified and was allowed in the space and was celebrated for the very first time. Um and that's something that's incredible I think and I showed I mean my mother and father have always been very very supportive. My whole family really has been. I showed my nana nani that piece and my grandmother was looking at me like this and she was like oh my god and she was in caps and she was like she was like vic vic the little daughter of kikata and i was and they were like talking to me about it and then she went you did really really well and they were both in oh. incredibly impressed and she said this to me and i will always remember this and i'll take this to my grave and whenever i get dressed up i always remember her in my ear she's my ear woman she said to me You know, you wouldn't be allowed to do this if one you couldn't dance and two you made an ugly woman. You don't you're neither. So you're allowed to do this now. And I said thank you. Oh so. my god. That's her ashirvad, her blessing. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear Rahim that they were so supportive and encouraging and I guess that leads very nicely onto my next question about your coming out journey. if you could go into that but before you do <laughs> digging into the archives and apparently your mom once said to your nanny i think it was your nanny that what if, what if one of your grandchildren is gay what if rahim is gay and your grand what did your nanny say he can't I be gay i i've seen his genitals and they are too big for him to be gay that's what your nanny said so if you could i just wanted to share that with everybody because i think i would love to meet your nanny um she uh, she just what a comment i hope you don't mind i know you would no, have minded me saying that because no. i know that there's no hold barred in this space so Good. tell us about that tell us about how nani felt because this is what nani is saying nani is saying that he can't be but your mom seems to have an inkling which is why she's asked your nani this question how did they respond to that you know your friends family community your dad what was the reaction um my family always knew it was never a thing and this is my immediate family so my parents and my uh, i've got three older brothers and and a younger sister so when we were all growing up it was never a thing i think my mother pulled me aside once and i would always be with her while she was getting ready and see her getting ready and be really interested in her whole process and she just mm-hmm. said, one day out of the blue in my uh, grandparents bathroom in oxfordshire She just said to me, "Oh, so you have you are you seeing anyone in school? Have you got a girlfriend or anything?" And I went, "No, no, no." And she went, "Okay." Then she was silent and then she went, "Are you seeing a boy? Like do you like any boys?" And I went, "Uh, no." <laughs> and she went, and she went, okay, like it's cool. Everyone knows like it's not an issue. And I remember one song that I always used to dance to when you asked me what song reminds me of my childhood. Another ma- major major song for me was Choli ke piche kya hai. Um Oh yeah. Yeah, and I grab like I used to grab any chuni that I could find and I used to do the whole thing and I used to like dance for it and it was my go-to party trick for my party piece when I was little. Don't in front of your family. Yeah, 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 but I was very young. So they yeah, yeah. deemed it as cute. Do you know what I mean? Okay, right, uh, right, right. My mother's best friend who is an aunt of mine. I see her as family. She's my blood. Like this woman has been with me, you know, through conception up until now. She <laughs> said and she said to my mum, you know that Rahim's probably going to grow up and be gay. Like he's gay. And she went, "Yeah, I know. We'll just wait for him to tell us." 
So it was never that's a wonderful. thing. Yeah, and I feel, I feel very, yeah, I feel very blessed to have this family around me and to have this support system and to have amazing people like my friends growing up from primary school to high school to university to meet incredible people like yourself and your sister and to have people like that around me is just so warming because I know that a lot of people don't have that. And yeah. what I do has been, I've been told, I, I never like to really almost think about it because I just think it's so alien to me that somebody can say this to me but for someone to turn around to me and say thank you so much for what you do because because of what you do I live through you and I see you and I see me and you and to be able to be some form of, form of representation for someone I think it's incredible. Um, that, that is, yeah. You know honestly I, I, I salute your family for that because there are a lot of people in you know who, are feel, who feel they can't express themselves and you know you've managed to express your authentic self as a person and through your love for dance but that's what dance is right form of expression no holds barred no judgment not everyone has that blessing or privilege so it's you know i'm so glad that you shared that and for anyone that you know is feeling a little bit apprehensive about speaking to a family member or friend about their their own sexual orientation especially if you are from the South Asian community, still has a stigma attached to it. You know, it's so nice to hear that, that um, although it's a rarity that you didn't have, you were not judged for it. And it's allowed you to flourish into the person that you are. The person that we're seeing, this confident, exuberant person in front of us with all this sass. It, it, you are that because they allowed, they, they allowed you to be that. They allowed you to be who you, who you are. Yeah, and it's, you know, yes, yeah, I was just going to add on that is not to say that I haven't had hardship. You know, I still have my moments where I was bullied um, growing yeah. up, and there were people at university that wouldn't walk near me. There were people um, on the streets that would shout things as I was growing up because I was in a form that I was still getting to grips with. Even though I was very confident in who I was, um, my body changed and my body shape um, was very feminine. Mm. Um, and I was only, you know, I was thin, I was svelte, but I, I had a bit of a curve going on and I started then to grow my hair and I had no facial hair and things like that. So it wasn't that I was exploring that part of my identity. It was just like, it almost it became embossed into me. And I lived that way for a very long time, believing that this is how people were perceiving me. And I was me and I was understanding myself as in this form. It wasn't until I started to get older and started exploring things through dance and just by speaking to my family to say that, you know what, no, I am an amalgamation of so many things. And it's just incredible to embody that and to feel pretty, you know, and to do one thing one day. And then to the other day, you know, you're lucky if I've washed my face. So, you know, there's moments where we all have these like times, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, we yeah, are all wearing, we're all wearing masks, you know, and, you know, just to, um, emphasize a point in, in the song that you performed for us earlier, I think that is very reflective of, it's not just about love, is it? It's not about that, like you explained earlier, it's about ha um, having, you know, love is such a powerful emotion, a powerful feeling, you know, why should I be afraid of this? And there's a line in there, I'm trying to remember it now, word for word, but bando se parda karna kya? There's a line that precedes that, which is saying, I don't have a veil between me and Kuda, between me and God. So why should I have this veil of pretense between me and another human being? Which I think mm -hmm. that's what that song encapsulates for me in terms of how you've expressed it. Not just about love, but having the um, confidence to be yourself. We, that's well, what that if, means. if you can't be you, who's going to be you? And the fact is, you. like, we have to embody who we are because this is the body that we've been given. This is the mind, the soul, everything that we've been given. And we need to be this person. Do you know what I yeah. mean? So, exactly. like, you need to do what you need to do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I've turned on the comments now, but uh, anyone who wants to ask Rahim any questions, I've got one more. Okay, go for it. Sorry, I spoke a lot. Um, actually, two questions. In the meantime, um, if you have, like I said, comments, questions, feedback, please drop them there in the comment box. Um, 
had when you performed on stage have any males approached you after your performance and been inspired to want to take up kathak as a dance form oh i thought that question was or bangra because no no i wasn't going to ask that the other question maybe offline but you also do bangra as well right you yeah. do bangra which and i love this versatility of you to just like you said the fluidity in gender and dance you can just move from one to the other so after you've done bangra off you done i suppose i suppose from kathak more so have you has anyone approached you and said you know what i i want to take up this dance form as well you've made me um you know want to explore it um yeah i think a lot of people have asked me if i teach or if i do something um in terms of classes and i never have done um mm. but in terms of gatak i always say to them like find out what you want to get from it and then pursue it understand yourself through the form first and read up on it and understand what it is and then go into it i always say that yeah. to people i think bhangra was something that i wanted to do because it challenged me to a form where my femininity was never brought into it and i remember in Italy when i was discussing becoming a bhangra dancer with a team um some was saying to me yeah but have you got have you got energy have you got character have you got personality have you got presence that's going to be matched up and equal to you know uh, 11 other male dancers who are all heterosexual and i was like right. like try me like because dance yeah. is not being a community and then i went to these classes and i you know joined and i did stuff at uni like everyone does and then from there got onto a professional team and did a competition in 18 you know so like and you could tell anyone from anything like we were exactly the same and i think that yeah being a kathak dancer allows me fluidity and form but then being a bhangra dancer allows me fluidity and form in a different way to challenge that to go through something completely different um have people approached me about both absolutely they have and i always just say to them do it just go to one class and just see how you feel yeah. you know yeah. and you never know what what potentialities and what things you can unlock about yourself in even just in one class an hour session mm. i mean with kathak specifically there's a gesture language called abhinaya right which is yeah. subtle movement of eyebrow and and that kind of stuff which bhangra doesn't have bhangra also people i think associate bhangra with this very masculine energy as well um but traditional bhangra if we think about jhumar and luddi these are actually very soft very graceful movements which mimic the sort of like farming farming techniques yeah, so yeah, yeah. although in modern bhangra we see you know a lot of this her and all of this i don't know i don't know what i'm doing i'm not a dance i'm a singer but you know we have this machismo but traditional bhangra dance forms they are very subtle and they are not men stomping around if you look at old videos and you look at the intricacy of the dance move they every graceful. dance form yeah in india tells a story they're not just jumping around every hand movement eyebrow movement is telling is, is narrating a story hence why the name kathak katha equals story so you're oh, yeah. you're a storyteller um so there's some questions we've got here before we get into that uh, into the questions rahim could you end with a performance for us and then we'll go into the questions we've got yeah. 15 minutes exactly so i will let you um tell everybody what this performance is a favorite of mine i actually requested this yeah this um, was this is for you this one this is well this is for all of us to enjoy but if you um oh. do you want to let everyone know what this is yeah so this is from a film called gohi noor um mm. and it's very very old very black and white it's called um madhuban me radhe ka naache de um and it it. it basically talks about how uh radha was the name of radhika is in um a space she yeah in the gardens um and she's there by herself doing what she does until she hears her lover's flute and then that just moves over her whole yeah. and his musicality is- becomes her musicality 
I, so you're going to do a little um, short just a very short not the type song, just the classical piece that's in there. It's more the Abhinaya the section, yeah. Exactly. So you can see Abhinaya, which is the gestural language of, of Kathak. So Rahim will be showing that to us. Um, do you want to go back and I'll let you know if we can see you? Yeah, I think it's, it's space here. Oh, fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. That yeah, that's perfect right there. Okay. Um, and this is a song, like I said, I requested Rahim to sing this, to perform this by Mohammed Rafi from the film Kohiru. I absolutely love it. So take it away, Rahim. The floor Thank is yours. Thank you so much. Here we go. Madhuban Meradhika Nach Madhuban Meradhika Nach Regir Dhar Ki Muraliya Baj Regir Dhar Ki Muraliya Baj Madhuban again Raheem that was just simply beautiful um, that's okay that wasn't too much I'm all right such wonderful wonderful comments here I'll let you have a scroll through and see um, you know for those that are not familiar with Gatak or the intricacies of Gatak so what he was doing there um, Abhinaya which is the gestural language of Gatak so the word Madhuban me Radhika Nache so he's dancing in the garden and Rahim literally was dancing in the garden. And when we, when he was, Whoa. the word Murli, <laughs> you were doing, what were you doing with the word Murli, which is a flute? With, with so the, the Murli, um, yeah, so you depict Krishna like this. So that's his Murli, that's, his yeah. flute is here. And then yeah. his flute and his peacock feather. So then exactly, that look at all that, yes. And the Kunguru, and you went, knelt down and tying your Kunguru and give her, give her, or give her, he is the name for, for Krishna. So, all these little subtle things that you notice in the storytelling of Gatak. Um, so beautiful. Let's get on to the questions. I, I know everyone loved that. It was just, Thank you, everyone. just such a wonderful thing for this army summer evening. I feel like I'm in, I felt like I was in Shalimar Bagh. You know, so beautiful. Let's, wow. let's get to some questions here. Um, yeah. We've got comments. I remember when you won one of the Bollywood University competitions, Dance So Beautifully. Raheem loved hearing your story and your journey. Question here from Mansab. I want to say kudos to Raheem for being himself so unabashedly and using his platform to express himself. I'm curious, has he received negativity on social media in regards to his sexuality? How has he dealt with it? And then a follow-up question from the same person. As a Bhangra dancer myself, 
I know the male Punjabi culture can be very toxic and breeds certain machoism. Did he face this during his Bhangra dancing, which was on point? So two questions then. Um, negativity on social media for what I do, um, not to my face. Um, okay. I'm, I'm sure that my, I've been spoken about and shared about. Um, although, as of recently, um, as of lockdown, TikTok, uh, you know, the blow of that. Yeah. I, two of my videos that I just made for TikTok between a friend and I got taken from that platform and put onto like meme or like meme pages. And um, one of them was a small Gidda piece that I did to hear from Jab Tak Hai Jan. Um, oh, yeah. That got taken and that was mocked essentially. Um, and to which I was really confused about because I was like, I don't understand what's going on because I hadn't seen it. Somebody else had told me about it. To which everybody bombarded it with messages and my support system was so strong. And it actually came from my Bhangra family, you know, from the team, from the people I know from Bhangra. They were the ones that were saying, you have no right to say anything about this person. You don't know anything about him. And they were very, very supportive of that. Another one that uh, actually got shared on a very famous one um, that everybody I know follows. And um, that was me doing Fungra. Um, and everyone was, um, again, very complimentary of it because it was Fungra. So it was the male form. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't until somebody wrote a comment, because they tagged me in it, somebody wrote a comment saying, yeah, he's an amazing dancer, but have you seen his Instagram profile? It doesn't make no damn sense. And it, all of these comments got deleted, but it, it mm. really doesn't make a difference because, and I always say this about myself, is that I can be a, a, a you know, for, for use of a better term, I can be that big jut energy that people want from Bhangra, yeah? Right. And I can give you that very much so. And I feel like people need to know that. And I say that my beard is thicker than your man's, but my makeup is better than your woman's. And that's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, they obviously, they're the ones that need to, Oh, are we so, lost sorry. You? Okay. Yeah, sorry, it went dark. I thought we lost you. Then. No, no, I'm here. Yeah, so yeah, I think I, Insta I think the the Instagram couldn't handle your comment. That's what yeah, it was. Exactly. It was just too and, powerful. And and that's what it is. And I think that like I I represent someone or a a body of people out there that can teeter totter between both worlds, and we should be allowed yeah. to do so. So have I faced negativity? Yes, and I've gotten over it. One with the support of others, but two knowing that actually your words are empty because I'm being celebrated for my dance form. Like, I'd like to see you do what I do. Like, try it. I really encourage yeah. you to try it. And I think you, I had to become, in this. Yeah. yeah, and I know what happens when you put yourself on social media. Like, you're opening yourself up to the world. So you better get what's happening out there on period. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and the second mm -hmm. question was, in terms of Fungra, yes, I've been surrounded by toxic masculinity in the Fungra community and everybody has and everybody knows it, you know, to the point where a common, a common phrase that you hear in the Fungra community, especially it's, um, with a lot of people and what they say is um, uh, girls shouldn't do Fungra or co-ed teams shouldn't exist because girls will never keep up with the guys and things along those lines. And there's a lot of toxic, there's a lot of toxicity in the Fungra scene which I think is a whole other, you know, realm. Mm. I know some female dancers that can dance circles around the male dancers, you know, and they're my inspiration. And the male dancers are also my inspiration because I see mm. them and I learn from these guys and I learn from these girls. And the Bhangra scene as a whole needs to very much accept that this dance form is for all. And we're mm. not here trying to prove anything. We're here learning this form to connect with our ancestry, to connect mm. with our mm. form, to connect with mm. our people and our communities mm. in mm. a society that deems us less worthy. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to say on the Bhangra scene because it could be something that's completely different. You, you know? could talk about that for ages. Yeah, yeah I mean, really I, I hope that answers um, your question, Sunny. I just want to point out there's a comment here from Jamini Sahai I'm sure you're aware of who she is she said beautiful to watch you for those that don't know Jamini is a Gatha dance teacher um, legendary in her own right married to Sanju Sahai who is a exponent of um, the Banaras Gharana you know a double exponent of the Banaras yeah. Gharana and she's just praised you so 
you know, I think that's like the highest compliment you can yeah, get thank for your you dog. So, yes. so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, we've got, Raheem, we've got four minutes and five more questions that have come personally. They're not, they've not been posted here. So um, I'm just wondering, would, if I ended this session now and started again, just for 15 more minutes to answer those questions, are you all right to do that? I'm okay to do that. Yeah, for everyone else. But if I end this now, I have done this once or twice before when the conversations got really enthralling like this one. Um, so I'll end it now. And if you all, <laughs> I'll let you have your drink in that time. If you all want to rejoin for another 15, 20 minutes, um, some of the questions, I'm, I'm going to screenshot them so that I have them here. Please do. Just give me, give me one moment. Um, and then I will restart this conversation i've got a lot of people saying can you can you save this um they've not commented here but yes okay thanks to everyone who says that they're going to rejoin i'm just screenshotting the conversations okay right i'm gonna end this now please join me in about 30 seconds see you on the other side i'll be there <laughs>